Healthy soil is the foundation for a sustainable landscape. Hello, I'm David McDonald. I'm an environmental scientist with Seattle Public Utilities. And this is part two of our two-part class. In the first part, we talked about soil science concepts as they relate to uh, developing or maintaining uh, healthy soil conditions uh, for landscape professionals. In this part, part two, we're going to talk uh, about putting that soil science to work uh, in preserving, restoring, and maintaining healthy soil conditions in a variety of landscape situations. First, before we dig into these practices, I want to talk about the regulatory environment here in Washington because it's changed in recent years as our State Department of Ecology has incorporated soil requirements into the stormwater management manual for Western Washington and now the manual for Eastern Washington as well. The stormwater management manual contains a number of BMPs or best management practices, which are actually required practices for stormwater management. And one that's required on all construction sites everywhere or will be very soon as it gets incorporated into local jurisdictions codes is BMP T513, post-construction soil quality and depth. And basically it very simply says that the best thing to do is to retain native soil and vegetation wherever possible but that for areas that are cleared or graded or disturbed during construction, you have to restore a minimum eight inch soil depth with an adequate organic matter content, and that helps restart the soil biology, and that you further have to scarify or break up the subsoil four inches below that eight inch layer. So actually you end up with, with a 12 inch uncompacted layer of soil. And then once that soil has been decompacted and amended with compost uh, or other organic matter, uh, it has to be protected from being recompacted and it needs to be mulched after planting with an organic mulch. And you should use maintenance practices that replenish the organic content. We'll talk about all that, but it's really pretty simple stuff, but it is a requirement now. In order to make it easier for landscape professionals and designers to put this into practice, soil scientists with the blessing of the Department of Ecology developed this manual, Building Soil Guidelines and Resources for Implementing BMP T513. Um, and basically it lays out the how-to to reach the stormwater manuals required 10% uh, organic matter for landscape beds or 5% uh, organic matter for turf areas. Um, and it requires developing a soil management plan, which is what we're going to talk about in a moment, which may have four options for soil management in different areas of any particular site. The first and easiest, of course, being to retain the undisturbed native soil and vegetation. And then other options, three options for restoring the soil, amending the existing soil in place with compost, stockpiling good quality topsoils and reusing it, or importing a topsoil that meets the organic matter uh, requirements. Uh, the menu also guides you through how to use either a pre-approved amendment rate or a custom calculated amendment rate. It has simple field inspection and verification procedures, and it includes model specifications written in the standard formats. And this is available at soilsforsalmon.org or buildingsoil.org. So that's our regulatory environment. Uh, now we're going to slow down and talk about uh, these various steps in preserving soil, re reusing site soils, modifying site soils or importing soils, developing a soil management plan, and then strategies for maintaining soil health. And we're going to wind up talking about the new National Sustainable Sites Benchmarks, which really sort of summarize all these steps. So here's our soil science web uh, that we talked about in part one soil physical properties, texture, structure, and density, chemical properties being nutrients and pH, and then biological properties of organic matter and soil life that all affect soil nutrient availability, pore space, and all the other functions of healthy soils that are important to us. 
When we look at a site, we oftentimes run into a number of modifications that have been made to the site here in our highway interchange. It's seriously modified. Obviously, the grade's been changed. Uh, soils have been compacted. Uh, different layers have been put one on top of another, uh, not always with the best thought. Um, and then uh, we are attempting to plant uh, typically into uh, oftentimes compacted or degraded soil conditions. One of the impacts of changing these soil profiles that we oftentimes run into is interfaces. And, and an interface is just a sharp border between soils of different textures. Interfaces limit air movement and they particularly limit water and root movement. Um, so uh, an interface between a fine textured soil and a coarse textured soil, between a high organic and low organic soil. And so practically what we try to do is to mix soils up um, as we place our, our final soils on the site, certainly the soils that are going to be growing medium. So the upper foot for turf uh, areas uh, and the upper several feet for tree or shrub growing areas, we'd like to mix up those layers. We can do that by mixing it with a bucket loader, by scarifying with teeth on our equipment as we uh, run over the site, or where we have a site that's compacted, putting a uh, ripper or a ripping bar or other scarification tool that can go a foot or more deeper into the soil to break up that compaction and mix up these layers and prevent their faces. Another cause uh, of soil problems is, of course, loss of organic matter, removal of the upper topsoil horizons, and compaction of subsoil. We can plan to protect existing soils where possible and minimize grading and cut and fill. And also on our sites, even where we are doing some grading, we can reduce compaction by minimizing traffic off of the road bases. And the good news is that we can actually restore even highly degraded soils, compacted low organic soils, by breaking up compaction and by incorporating a mature stable compost into that soil. Oftentimes in urban environments, we may see chemical changes, changes in pH, sometimes caused by compaction and anaerobic condition that will cause the soil to become more acidic, nutrient deficiencies through loss of topsoil, and then of course oils, metals, chemicals, and other things that may have been spilled into the soil at different times that may have caused contamination. Fortunately, loosening soils and amending them with compost tends to correct all of these problems. Won't fix anything, but it can certainly help. And as we start into our site, it's good to do some test pits and visually examine and smell, look for signs of deficiencies or particularly toxins. And then where we're not certain what's going on there to take some samples and send them off to a lab and get it tested. Of course, we want to choose plants that are well adapted to our site conditions, so whether that's pH, drainage, etc. So that's going to affect our plant palette for the site. Now we'll talk a little bit about strategies for preserving the existing site soil. And this feeds into our soil management plan, but really, first of all, we want to identify areas that we may be able to protect during construction, fence them off, sign them, make it clear to all the subcontractors that they need to stay out of that area, so communicate with everyone. And then if we do need temporary access to provide some sort of surface protection from compaction, whether it's steel plates, or six inches of coarse wood chip so that vehicles can move across it without compacting the soil. But that's really second best. We'd like to keep vehicles out of these areas entirely. We can simplify the site footprint by combining paved areas and buildings and leaving larger undisturbed areas, consolidating the planting spaces, deciding early on which trees we will be able to protect the root, whole root zone and protect, uh, or which trees, in fact, we're going to damage their root zone enough, we should just remove those trees and plan to replant them or plant new trees. We can balance and reduce cut and fill on a site so that we're not hauling so much soil off of the site and hauling so much in. Of course, we can stockpile good topsoil for reuse. And uh, in particular, again, 
identifying to all the contractors areas that are going to be protected and areas that are appropriate to use for laydown areas is going to help us manage the overall impact on the site. Now we'll look at restoring site uh, soils in place. Um, as I mentioned, the good news is that we can take even pretty compacted and low organic soils and end up with a functional soil condition just by decompacting them, uh, physically breaking them up and incorporating organic matter uh, into the soil. The best material to use, the best organic matter to use is a mature stable compost. You can use other organic materials, but you need to have a soil scientist involved if you are going to use uncomposted materials. So a mature, stable compost is really the best amendment. There are a variety of ways to incorporate these. Some folks who are gardeners may be familiar with the English double spading method where you dig a trench, put the soil to the side, and then dig another trench and incorporate your compost into that and then backfill with the top layer from the next trench over. And again, so that you're um, amending two layers deep as you go along. You can do the same kind of thing with your heavy equipment as shown in the bottom here and actually putting down the compost as a pad to reduce compaction and then uh, digging it into the soil and then uh, perhaps tilling compost into the top layer. So that's one strategy. Depending on the equipment you have on site and your equipment operators, there are a variety of strategies you can use to reduce compaction and incorporate organic matter deeply into the soil. You can also incorporate organic matter uh, just by ripping it in with a variety of equipment here. On the left, we're doing a large site with a ripper uh, mounted on a cat. On the right, we're incorporating some organic matter in a very small site just by using a trenching machine and using that to actually incorporate some compost into the soil. So it really depends on the size of the site and the equipment you have available. Now let's look at if you stockpiled some soil on site, how you might modify that or imported soils uh, to end up with a better soil condition on the site. First of all, when you first look at the site, you want to identify where you have high quality topsoils. And if you have room on the site, and you don't always do, but if you have room, uh, scrape off and stockpile those high quality topsoils and cover them with a breathable layer if possible. So a breathable fabric or coarse wood chips is actually better than impermeable plastic because air can get into it. Plastic's okay, but a breathable layer is better. And then after you've done your site grading, you can bring uh, that topsoil back. And if you still need some more organic matter into it, you can amend it with compost at that time. Just use the bucket loader to mix a scoop of compost with two scoops of soil and then spread it out on the site. It's important to avoid recompacting soil when it's been respread. So in this case, in the bottom picture, we've put down our quarry spall or rock roadways, and we've told all the contractors to just drive on those road bases and stay off the compost mended soil so that we don't recompact it. As we talked about in the soil science part one of the class, soil peds or the larger particles in the soil are an important part of soil structure, and we'd like to not break those up. So we like to use big buckets and not grind up the soil. We like to keep it in fairly large chunks on the site rather than um, screening it heavily. So if we are going to use a, a lot of times we can avoid screening altogether, but if we are going to screen to get out some rocks, we can use a larger screen like a two to three inch screen and just get the rocks out so that we don't grind up all those soil peds. And then when we replace that soil, we can again work it with large buckets, mix the compost in with the bucket loader and have teeth on all our equipment so that as we back out of the site, we can scarify each layer so that we're not going to end up with a sharp interface on the next layer of soil. And also using tracked equipment that has low ground pressure will really help us reduce compaction on the site. Again, here's an example of placing multiple lifts on a site with the top being our traditional placing multiple lifts 
and the bottom being placing lifts sort of diagonally so that you're not driving over them and recompacting them. Um, so this is something that you can work with your heavy equipment operators to try to end up with a less compacted condition on the side. Then uh, at the end, we can till in some compost at our top layer in order to end up with our upper six to eight inches of soil having more organic matter into it. And that's important because we want the most organic matter closest to the surface. Here again, top left examples of a screened soil or an unscreened soil with larger peds, which is actually better for tree or landscape uh, installation. Now for a turf installation, you might to mix it up or uh, screen it more finely. But for trees and landscapes, the larger ped size are really great and large stones are not a problem. Sticks and stones, just fine in your soil for tree or land landscape installation. For a turf area, you may need to screen those out, at least for the upper part of the soil. So we recommend for your soil specs to eliminate the term free of and rather allow certain amounts of large chunky stuff in the soil unless you need uh, a fine grained soil, for instance, for turf installation. For amending an existing soil on site, again, using a bucket loader and mixing it on site is oftentimes a good way to do it. Use your either your delivered soil or your stockpiled site topsoil and just mix a bucket of compost each two or three buckets of site soil uh, and replace that on site. A variety of equipment that you can use, and it really depends on what equipment you have available and the size of the site. Obviously, with your tractor-mounted tiller, you can only get 8 to 12 inches deep, whereas with a, a bucket loader, you can go deeper, which might be good for trees uh, or other larger plants that are going deeper into the soil. As we talked about in part one of this course, Soil tests from a soil lab use the term soil organic matter to indicate the difference between the dry weight of the soil when it's first dried and then after it has been heated up to burn off as much carbon as possible, leaving of course the ash and carbon that hasn't burned off in the soil. So by soil lab test, for instance, a compost, which is 100% organic matter in the common sense use of that term, will only be 40 to 70% organic matter because there's a lot of heavy ash and unburnt off carbon left when you try to burn off the organic matter in that soil. So the soil organic matter by lab test of that compost will only be 40 to 70%. Even a fairly high organic soil, the soil organic matter will only be, uh, well, maybe maximally 10%, usually 5 to 8%. So uh, in order to amend soils, we need to add proportionately more compost to reach a, a target soil organic matter. So for instance, for uh, a target soil organic matter of one to 3% uh, for tree installations, we need to add 10 to 15% compost by volume to a soil. And for turf installations, uh, we, where we'd like to have a target organic matter by lab test, by that loss on combustion test of three to eight percent, we need to add 15 to 25 percent compost by volume to the soil mix. For the extreme case, uh, bioretention swales, where we'd like to have 10 percent soil organic matter by the loss on ignition test, we need to add 30 to 40 percent compost by volume to the soil mix. So that's a bucket of compost to every two buckets of soil when we mix up the soil. So that's kind of the extreme for the, the bioretention soils. That may be more organic matter than you want. So it depends on your use, as we said. And as we mentioned earlier, we want to mimic nature so that we have the most organic in the upper layer of the soil. So we might use our bucket loader as we place the lower layers of soil to mix compost into the lower layers at say a 10 to 15% layer. And then we might spread several inches of compost at the surface and use a tractor or walk behind tiller uh, or a ripper bar to mix that into the upper foot or so of soil, eight to 12 inches of soil at a much higher level uh, up to sort of 30% compost by volume in that upper layer but we wouldn't want that high organic amount two feet down in the soil. So again, try to mimic nature. The most 
uh, organic matter in the upper 8 to 12 inches of soil and some organic matter but less in the lower 2 to 3 feet down if you can do that. Part of the reason for that is that decaying organic matter uses up oxygen and of course the lower layers of soil it's more difficult for them to breathe than the upper layers of soil that are close to the surface. And we have, if we have too much organic too deep in the soil, we can create an anaerobic condition in that soil, which is not good for plant growth. So we want most of our organic matter near the surface, the upper eight to 12 inches of soil. And of course, you wanna put your foundations on compacted subsoil. So the house foundations, the road foundations, and any other structures should go on compacted subsoil. So in the case of our flagpole here, they tried to put the flagpole on top of uh, compost amended soil, bad idea. Your uh, foundations need to go on subsoil and then fill in around them with amended soil uh, for proper plant growth. Selecting compost uh, is, is actually pretty easy, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But if you're in a region where you don't have access to tested and certified compost, it's good to know that there are some simple field tests that you can do. Just taking a handful and smelling it, earthy smell, not sour, or stinky, or ammonia smell, black to brown color, uh, uniform particle size, a stable temperature. So if you have a big pile of it and you wet it, it doesn't get real hot, which would indicate that it's not through compost, neither too dry so it's powdery, nor soaking wet so it's goopy. Those are some simple tests, eye and hand tests that you can do. You can also send it off to a soil lab to get nutrients, salinity, pH, organic matter. And your compost supplier can supply typically all those tests. And the really good thing is if you're here in Washington, getting your compost from a state permitted composting facility, those facilities have to go through a lot of testing that pretty much demands uh, that they produce a high quality compost. And even better, anywhere in Washington and anywhere in the US, if you buy from a facility that subscribes to the US Composting Council's seal of testing assurance or STA test methods, the test methods are called TMECC, and I won't tell you what that means, but you can look it up. Uh, but those test methods require tests for a bunch of things that you might care about, like carbon and nitrogen ratio, weed seed tests, nutrients, salinity, contaminants, nutrient levels, size, particle size, maturity, things that really matter to you as a landscaper. So you can get all those tests from your compost facility if you buy a STA approved compost. So it's really your best assurance of good quality. And then there is also a test that you can use on site if you're not sure about your compost maturity. It's called the Solvita test. You can Google Solvita test. You can buy these tests. They're a few bucks a piece. Uh, it's something you can do on site in a few hours and get a read on your compostability and maturity that is going to really help you fine tune and be sure that you've got a good quality compost on site. An important attribute is carbon to nitrogen ratio, and that's just how much carbon to how much nitrogen there, there is in the compost. You can get that same test for your soils too. But generally, uh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of compost that we like to see for most for turf and most landscapes is about 20 to one to 25 to one. That has good nitrogen availability uh, and good carbon availability for our typical landscape plants. However, for trees and for native plants here in Washington, uh, you can use a higher carbon landscape, one that's got relatively more woody stuff and less green stuff in it, up to 30 to one to 35 to one, and a coarser compost, it's chunkier. That can actually be good for native plants and trees. There are different feedstocks, different things that are used to make compost. Generally, for most landscape uses, we like to see a yard waste or a plant-based compost. That's going to give us a good carbon and nitrogen balance, good nutrient availability, good maturity and stability. 
For landscapes, you can also use a biosolid or sewage sludge based compost it's where the sewage sludge has been composted with a woody material. And as long as it's fully composted, that's a good landscape compost. Another material is a manure based compost, whether it's horse manure, cow manure, chicken manure. But those need, like the biosolids, they need to be fully composted with a carbon source like uh, woody material in order to end up with an appropriate carbon to nitrogen ratio and appropriate stability and maturity for landscape growth. Just as an aside, here in Washington and around the country, more and more we've been using compost for temporary erosion and sediment control during construction. The compost berms at the top left or compost socks top right or compost blankets shown in the bottom two pictures, a large compost blanket being installed in late fall and then uh, the next spring you can see the growth on that site. These have great value for temporary erosion control during construction and obviously you're also getting compost on site that can be used for better plant growth during construction. There's more information available about these strategies at the buildingsoil.org website. One strategy that builders sometimes use to try to improve a heavy soil is to mix sand into that soil. Frankly, it doesn't work very well most of the time. If you have like a heavy clay or clay silt soil and you mix sand into it, you tend to get adobe, a good building material, but because it's so tightly mixed, air and water don't get into it. It's not a great soil mix to start out with. So really, unless you're going to mix a lot of sand into your soil, we don't recommend doing what's shown in this picture. Instead, we recommend just mixing good quality organic matter into those soils. Some other materials that are sometimes used with some success, particularly in heavy clay soils, gypsum actually can chemically improve the clay structure somewhat in the similar way that organic matter does by opening up clay soils chemically so that those little flat clay particles open up and allow more air and water into the soil. You can also, if you want to add a physical media to improve the soil, rather than sand, you can use expanded shale or lava rock too. These are relatively expensive materials but are sometimes used for some sites. Practically speaking, uh, a good quality organic matter mixed into our heavier soils or into sandy soils improve structure, uh, improve drainage, aeration, root access, water and nutrient cycling. There are a variety of uh, products that are sold for uh, additional amendments that are uh, of a biological nature. People use compost teas which are very effective as foliar sprays for plant disease protection, less valuable as a soil amendment, although sometimes people, if they're amending a soil with compost, may also use a compost tea to increase the inoculation of that soil. Another thing is these mycorrhizal inoculants, as we talked about in part one, mycorrhiza just means root fungus and these are the native or natural fungi that grow in and with the soil and that are synergistic with our plants. Plants require them to grow just the same as we require the bacteria in our stomachs and guts to uh, digest food. Plants require these beneficial fungi and we can inoculate soil or in better inoculate plant roots with mycorrhizal inoculants but they are specific to species or certain genera for instance turf or deciduous tree inoculants uh, so you need to match the inoculant to the plant type and they need to be applied right at the time that it's installed. Some other additives of a biological nature, uh, seaweed, other uh, biological additives can be good for micronutrients, sometimes for supporting growth. For fertilization, in general, we want to rely on a healthy soil with good organic matter, but we can supplement that with fertilizers and uh, we're always best off to use organic or natural sources and we want to base fertilizer applications on soil test results. So 
send a soil sample away to a soil lab, see what they say you actually need before fertilizing. For modifying soil chemistry, um, again, using organic matter first is going to increase our cation exchange capacity. And then fixing pH, compost will help buffer pH towards a more neutral pH. But we can also use lime in particular, where we have a soil that is too acidic. Where we have a soil that's too alkaline, we sometimes use sulfur applications, but they tend to be only temporary in improving that pH. We're really better to use our organic amendments to help buffer soil towards a nutrient pH. Um, and, and as previously said, um, if you think you've got soil problems or you've got plant problems, get a soil test from a good lab that's going to give you recommendations on how you can fix that. But the easiest things to fix and best things to fix are organic matter and pH. That is really going to help fix a lot of your nutrient availability. Again, you can see sort of the ideal, ideal pH levels for availability of nutrients. And you can see that kind of sweet spot, just slightly acid with seven being uh, neutral, uh, a pH of 6.3 to 6.8 or seven kind of gives you good availability of all your plant nutrients. So that is, that's uh, kind of ideal. And ideally, adding compost to a soil or having a good amount of organic matter, the weak uh, organic acids in that organic matter tend to buffer either an alkaline or an acid soil towards that kind of ideal 6.3 to 6.8 pH. So having good organic matter helps make all your plant nutrients more available. As we mentioned before, trees aren't heavy feeder. We don't harvest a lot from them and they get their nutrients from the soil. So generally we do not need to fertilize trees. Uh, we just need to restore organic matter by leaving the leaf drop, using organic mulches on the surface of the soil like wood chips. If you have a tree problem, it may be a micronutrient problem or other problem. And the first thing to do is to get a soil test and see what the problem may actually be. Uh, adding too much fertilizer around trees can actually cause a lot of plant disease problems. And this is something we see oftentimes where we have turf areas that we're fertilizing adjacent to tree areas. Soil toxicity is difficult to determine and expensive. When you first get on a site, you wanna do some test pits, take a look, smell, and then if you suspect contamination problems, you may want to get a soil scientist on the site to get a look at it and help you figure out what soil test to order because those tests get expensive real quick. So you need to figure out whether you're ordering a lead or arsenic test, other chemicals, hydrocarbons from oil leaks or other things. Fortunately, again, amending soil with compost uh, helps break down hydrocarbons, bind up metals, make things less toxic. But there are situations where you do need to remove a layer of soil or cap the soil. And this is where you need a soil scientist involved. Now we'll talk a little more about developing a soil management plan for your site, which is really the key from start to finish. We start really at the design stage to develop our soil management plans by surveying soils and then once we've surveyed our soils, we can figure out where we have high quality soils that we want to try to protect and where we're going to be grading or otherwise disturbing soils that we're going to need to disturb. And then we can start to lay that into a soil management plan, which has two components, a scale drawing of the site that shows those different areas, and then a narrative form that describes how we're going to treat each area on the site. As we mentioned in part one, it's also good to identify a reference soil, a soil that's in good condition, maybe on your site, or it may be an adjacent undisturbed site that you can take some soil cores or probes or soil tests that tell you what would be a good condition to try to restore soils to on your site. Uh, so reference soil is very useful. Then we're going to map our soils that we're going to protect from disturbance, not drive on, not use for construction lay down. 
We're going to identify the roadways and map those uh, construction laydown areas. We're going to identify the areas that are going to be restored to a vegetated area at the end of this project and label those areas. And then on the soil management plan narrative or form, we're going to identify each of those areas, how we're protecting this area or for areas that we're restoring, how we're going to either break up compaction, you know, rip it or till it or whatever, and how much compost or organic amended topsoil we're going to bring in for each area. And that's going to make it very easy to track through the site because you have your soil management plan on site and throughout the project, you can show it to your subcontractors to indicate these are the areas you're protecting. And then it's easy for the landscape architect or the project manager or the government official who is going to come uh, and examine the site to look at the soil management plan and determine which areas have been restored. Uh, and that inspector can then determine if they've been restored uh, per the soil management plan. As I mentioned, example soil management plans are available at buildingsoil.org. Here's an example of protecting a tree root zone area on a site. And we've actually put a sign on here that indicates the value of this tree and uh, notifies the subcontractors that if they mess it up, they get to pay for it. And you might not want to be quite this bald, but letting the subs know that there are consequences if they mess up the soil, that basically they're going to have to pay to restore the soil. Or in this case, if they damage the soil over the root zone of a valuable tree, they may end up paying for that tree. Um, that certainly gets their attention. We need, as I mentioned, to communicate this to all the subs, the grading contractor, the utilities subcontractors. Here on the left is an example where they've used an air spade to blow and suck the dirt out from around these roots without cutting them and then lay their utilities in underneath the root zone and then they can refill that root zone. And they've also used the plywood to uh, protect the tree trunk during construction. On the right, you can see how that's being done along a whole very tight street right away. So this is a pretty tight example, but um, successful tree preservation being done. Easier to do on a site where you have more room to move around. Obviously, different sites have different challenges, space and the amount of time you have for contractor operations, the cost versus the environmental benefit. Practically speaking, you may be able to protect the root zones of some trees and you just can't other trees because you've got to drive over that area too much, in which case that's a tree to be removed and replanted after construction. If you can't protect its root zone, you're not going to save the tree. A year or two later, it's just going to die. We know we don't want to work soil too much during wet periods. We don't want to till things in during really wet conditions. So we may need to plan around that. And uh, obviously we need to educate our contractors, subcontractors, owners, and build this in from the very beginning of the project. Again, on buildingsoil.org, we have some fact sheets that will help you learn about erosion control, about how to fit soil protection and amendment into your construction process plan and other useful tools, again, at buildingsoil.org. We'll talk briefly about soil maintenance, although this is the thing that uh, most of our landscape professionals really know a lot about anyway. Basically, we're going to try to prevent weed invasion while plants are fully establishing on the site and restore organic matter. And one way we do that is with organic mulches, typically a wood chip mulch. This arborist wood chip mulch that we're using here, just ground up tree prunings, is really about the best uh, mulch material for all kinds of landscape sites. We can use it around perennial woody plants or around trees and shrubs. For annual plants, you know, your annual uh, flower beds, uh, turf areas, uh, vegetable gardens, we like to use a non-wood mulch. And those non-woody mulches typically would be a compost material, sometimes uncomposted grass clippings or something. The reason is that woody mulches do a really good job at preventing weeds from growing in the upper surface of the soil, but they'll also prevent shallow rooted annual plants from growing uh, because they're so high in carbon and so low in nitrogen, whereas non-woody mulches like compost are great for growing those shallow rooted plants but of course they also grow weeds well. A strategy that works really well where you want to improve your soil 
in uh, general landscape beds, but you obviously can't till uh, compost into it because you've got plant roots, established plants and trees, shrubs already there, is to do the layer cake method. Spread a couple inches of compost and then come back over it with three to four inches of wood chips on top of that compost. The compost will decompose and get moved down into the soil by earthworms. They actually grab bits and till it down into the soil fairly quickly over a year or so, but the woody mulch will persist on the surface and protect the soil from compaction, provide good aeration, and of course the woody mulch is good at preventing weeds from growing. Other soil maintenance practices, obviously returning our plant droppings, whatever they are, leaves or grass clippings, onto the site wherever possible, grass cycling, using a mulching mower, and then where we do either have plants that are heavy feeders, you know, whether it's a vegetable garden or in some cases turf, where we need to do some fertilization, basing fertilization on soil tests and perceived plant needs. A good place to learn about all of this is the Washington State University Soil Management website. You can see Dr. Craig Cogger there teaching us how to do a soil test in a video. He also has a video showing us how to do the soil texture test. There are printouts on how to read soil test results that you get back from a lab and understand those. So really just a lot of resources on that WSU soil management site. Here's the link and you can also just Google WSU soil management and that'll get you there. Another really good resource that uh, basically every landscape professional should have on their shelves is the book Up by Roots by Jim Urban, which is 40 years of training and practice by one of the preeminent landscape architects and tree experts in the US on how to make trees work in an urban landscape. And just a lot of great information. So uh, available from amazon.com, uh, the book Up by Roots, really highly recommended. As we mentioned in the first part, trees actually feed the soil by photosynthesizing and releasing carbohydrates into the soil to feed their beneficial soil organisms. And those soil organisms then extract nutrients and water and other things from the soil and make them available to the plants over time. So as long as tree roots can get to the soil and that soil can get oxygen so it can exchange with the air at the surface, Trees can actually grow in surprisingly urban sites. In this case, we've got paving panels over an engineered soil where the tree roots can reach into that whole soil area and that soil area can exchange gases through the permeable paving area. So these trees can actually grow surprisingly well. This is just an example of some of the many successful strategies that you can learn about in Jim Urban's book, Up by Root. To wrap up, I'm going to summarize our soil best practices in the light of a new national rating system for sustainable landscapes, and that is the Sustainable Sites Initiative, or SITES for short. Probably most of you are familiar with the U.S. Green Building Council's rating system for green buildings, the LEED rating system, L-E-E-D. SITES is a new national rating system for site and landscape, which is developed in parallel with LEED. Actually, they share some properties and have been developed together. Like LEED, SITES has both prerequisites, things that are required, and credits, extra credit things that you can do on your site. The SITES guidelines uh, are available at sustainablesites.org and they reach all the way through every phase of the project from site selection. They talk about preserving high value soils through uh, pre-design planning, surveying your soils as we talked about in the first part, and then protecting existing soil and vegetation wherever possible, developing a soil management plan, and then implementing that through the construction phases and using that soil management plan to end up with a functioning soil on the site that functions to conserve water, to have healthy plants grow, to manage stormwater on site and all the other benefits that we're looking for from soil. And then after construction, developing an operations and maintenance plan that will recycle organic materials, monitor soil health, and create long-term sustainable maintenance on the site. Again, all this is available at the sustainable sites. And those are really the summary of our soil best practices from 
the very first thought of developing a project on a site all the way through project planning, development, construction, and then ongoing uh, operations and maintenance. So that's our part two of this Healthy Soils course. Uh, this part has been about soil protection, preservation, restoration, and maintenance practices in landscapes. If you missed the part one soil science, go back and look at it. It's on the same site that this presentation is on. And also there's a resource list that has all these resource links you can click on and go to uh, on that same website. Thank you. Again, remember healthy soil is the foundation for a sustainable landscape, a landscape that's easy to maintain, good for the environment, looks great year round and healthy for people and plants and wildlife and all of us. Thank you. And last thought, you always need to fit your soil conditions to your intended use on the site. We talk about right plant, right place, but we also need to think about right plant, right soil.